the speaker chairs and the wonderful audiences in different parts of the world. Welcome to the SNS webinar. The speaker for the first session of today is our honored guest from Japan, Professor Ken Matsushima. Professor Matsushima is the Associate Professor at the Department of Neurosurgery, Tokyo Medical University under Professor Michihiro Kono from Japan. He underwent fellowship in microsurgical neuroanatomy under Professor Albert Rotten, a mentorship in the United States of America, focusing on skull base, which include jugular foramen, venous system, temporal bone, and brainstem. He's also studied surgical management, particularly brainstem surgery under Professor Helmut Bertanafi in Germany. His research has been widely published, including two front cover of the Journal of Neurosurgery, and he has received several national and international awards, such as, such as Young Neurosurgeon Award from the World Federation of Neurological Societies and Ramondi Award from the International Society for Pediatric Neurosurgery. We are extremely honored to have him today at our webinar. And today he'll be talking about skull-based surgery based on neurosurgical anatomy, what I learned from lab and OR. The speaker for the second session of today is our honored guest from India, Professor Sumit Shinha. Professor Shinha is the director of brain and spine surgery at the Paras Hospital, Guagon, India. He was the past professor of neurosurgery at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, Delhi. He's also the annual CME convener of Board of Education of NSI. We are extremely honored to have him today at our webinar, and today he'll be talking about minimalism in neurosurgery, the keyhole concept. The chair for the first session today is our honored guest from Turkey, Professor Abuza Gango. Professor Gango is the Associate Professor at the Department of Neurosurgery, Bakikol Research and Training Hospital of Psychiatric Neurology and Neurosurgery, and the Director of the Micro Neurosurgery Laboratory, Yediptep uh, University, Istanbul, Turkey. He's also the former fellow of the prestigious Roton uh, Laboratory. He's also a noted author with several publications in various peer review journals. We are extremely grateful for him to accepting our invitation to chair the first session of today's webinar. The chair for the second session today, our, our webinar is our honorable guest from Indonesia, Professor Astra. Professor Astra is the associate professor in the Department of Neurosurgery in the Faculty of Medicine, Ali Langau University, Dr. Sotomo General Hospital, Surabaya, Indonesia. He was the past General Secretary of the Indonesia Association of Neurosurgical Specialists for the 2017 to 2021 period and General Secretary of Asian uh, Neurosurgical Society or Association of Neurosurgical Specialists of Asian countries. In addition, he is the current Chairman of Surabaya Neuroscience Institute. His clinical interests are focused upon complex brain tumors, cerebral vascular surgeries. He's also a noted author with several publications in various peer review journals. He's also invited faculty to various workshops and conferences around the world. We are extremely grateful to him for accepting our invitation to chair the second session of today's webinar. On behalf of the Education Committee and the President, Professor Yukato, I would like to welcome both the speakers and the chairs and the wonderful audiences to this online platform of the SNS webinar. A warm welcome to our colleague in China, and we are extremely thankful to Professor Zubin for broadcasting this webinar on the WeChat channel. Uh, and with that introduction, I will hand over this online podium to our first chair, Professor Abuzel Gongo. Professor, please. Dear colleagues, honorable guests, Ken and Sumit, and fellow neurosurgeons from all over the world, it is an honor uh, and privilege for me to appear before you. Uh, I would like to express my apple trade to the organizers and for inviting me to speak at this wonderful event. As you know, skull base surgery has come a long way since its inception. Pioneers in the field in this field have continued to innovate and evolve, and allowing us to uh, access and treat lesions in the most challenging and complex areas of the skull base. The combination of microsurgical anatomy and the latest uh, technology has revolutionized the way we approach and perform these surgeries. With what we have learned both in the lab and the operating room, we have re realized that vital importance of comprehensive understanding the complex anatomical relationship at the skull base. Microsurgical anatomy is the cornerstone 
that supports our ability to navigate this complex landscape, allowing us to min minimize complication and optimize patient outcome. Today, Ken Matsushima, as you said, is the former fellow of Professor Roton and also his father Toshio uh, give, sent him the best workers scan. Uh, he's uh, focused in skull base, uh, microsurgical anatomy, and he published several papers uh, about this uh, skull base anatomy and approach. Today, he will talk about uh, microsurgical uh, anatomy of skull base and uh, what we learned from uh, laboratory and what we did in operating room. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, my friend, Abzor. First of all, I would like to thank Professor Kato, Professor Bean, and all those working hard to organize this incredible webinar. And it is a great honor for me to be given this opportunity to present here. Please give me a few seconds to in introduce myself. My grandfather was one of the founding members of the Japanese Neurosurgical Society around 1960s, and I started my residency under my father, who was one of the initial members of Dr. Rotten's lab. After the residency, I studied microsurgical anatomy under Professor Rotten, brainstem surgery under Professor Berdanfi, and I am now working on the Professor Kono as a member of Skullbase team at Tokyo Medical University. From the lab to the OR is what Professor Rotten established, what all the Rotten's fellows took over, and recently Professor Fernandez Miranda has been promoting this idea. Today, I'd like to share some of my experience of this idea from the lab to the OR, and also, I want to talk some of my examples, what I directly learned in the OR, not in the lab. My first project in Dr. Rotten's lab was intradural drilling of the temporal bone facing the cerebral pontine angle through the retrosigmoid approach. This technique extends the surgical fit in the cerebral pontine angle, but vital structures inside the temporal bone, such as the semicircular canals, and the internal acoustic, internal colloid artery should be preserved during the drilling. You can reach to the Meckel's cave and the middle fossas through the supramietal extension, approach inside the internal acoustic meatus through the transmetal extension, and access inside the jaguar foramen through the suprajagular extension. By removing this supramietal tubercle, the superextension enables access to the Meckel's cave and the paracellular region. A traditional variation of the interdural temporal bone drilling, the transmetal extension, removing the posterior wall of the internal acoustic meatus, provides reach inside the acoustic meatus. By angle length, by angle length and the scope, you can see each of the four nerves with nervous intermediates and the transverse crest. By the super jugular extension, during this roof of the jugular foramen, you can access the upper jugular foramen. This is a meningioma extending into the upper jugular foramen and the internal acoustic meatus. After the suboxidal craniotomy in a park bench position, we de dissected seven and eight cranial nerves from the caudal side and the lower cranial nerves from the caudal side. After removal of the stoner part of the tumor, the 10th bar dula was dissected and the transmetal and the suprajugular drilling exposed the internal acoustic meatus and the jugular foramen. After removing the intramedial tumor, the intrajugular tumor was pulled out from the jugular foramen while meticulously separating from the lower cranial nerves. This is the final view after complete tumor removal. And she suffered class D hearing disturbance before the surgery, but it improved to class A as we often experienced. Around the lateral foramen magnum, several approaches have been proposed so far. The various names of those approaches may confuse us, 
But we believe that a combination of each one of these factors should be considered in each case based on detailed anatomical knowledge. The condylar veins are good landmarks working around the lateral foramen magnum. And the appropriate manipulation of these veins can prevent troublesome bleeding from venous plexus around the vertebral artery. Here is the posterior condylar veins connecting the ve vertebral venous plexus and sigma the jugular venous system. And the anterior condylar vein, also known as venous plexus of the hypoglossal canal, and the lateral con condylar vein running around the occipital condyle connects the anterior conjugal confluence and the vertebral venous plexus. This is a case of meningioma located ventral foramen magnum. In the park bench position, the suboccipital muscles were divided from the midline and the foramen magnum and C1 were exposed. The posterior conjugal vein was coagulated and the lateral foramen magnum was widely exposed by removal of conjugal fossa and C1 posterior arch. Following the posterior conjugal vein, we performed additional drilling to achieve wider surgical field to approach the ventral brainstem. After dual opening, the cerebral medullary fissure was slightly opened to help cellular retraction. The ball type electrode was placed on the vagus nerve for real time continuous monitoring, which will, I will introduce later. Through the space between the lower cranial nerves, the tumor was carefully separated from the medullar and the bilateral vertebral arteries, and total resection was achieved. Her hemiparesis disappeared after the surgery. This is a case of the triple dumbbell-shaped jugular foramen schwannoma with intracranial, intraforaminal, and extracranial extensions, which occluded the sigmoid sinus. In the supinolateral position, after a small suboxtar craniotomy, the sigmoid sinus was skeletonized and exposed, and the jugular foramen was opened. The high cervical exposure exposed the 11th cranial nerves, the internal jugular vein, and the extracranial tumor. The sigmoid sinus and the, inter and the internal jugular vein was ligated, and the dual incision was started from the posterior fossa and extended to cross the sigmoid sinus. In the cerebral pontine angle, we carefully separated the intact fibers of the lower cranial nerves and the seven and eight cranial nerves from the intracranial tumor. The, in the intrajugular tumor was also removed and the venous flow from the anterior conjugal confluence was promptly stopped. The extracranial tumor was also rejected and we achieved complete tumor removal. Here is the post-op MRI without any residual tumor. As like the Sylvian fissure in the supratentorial surgery, fissures are the biggest gateway for neurosurgeons to access deeply straighted lesions without dividing any neural structures. The cerebral medullary fissure opening is one of the greatest achievement in the Rotons lab and the most typical example of this idea from the lab to the OR. But recently, various techniques using opening of other fissures have been proposed, such as the cerebral pontine fissure. The biggest fissure in the posterior fossa are the three cerebral brainstem fissures, cerebral mesencephalic, cerebral pontine, and the cerebral medullary fissures. When we talk about the brainstem surgery, we often focus only on the safer entry zones into the brainstem. However, how to expose the brainstem surface before penetrating into the brainstem, brainstem is as critical as the selection of the safer entry zones. This is a specimen which I removed the left half of the cerebellum. 
what I had what I had to transact for removal of the cerebellum was only the cerebellar peduncles. And you can see how deep the three cerebellar brainstem fissures are and how large you can expose the brainstem surface when totally opening the fissures. The cerebellum mesencephalic fissures extends caudally between the midbrain and the cerebellum, and the SCA and the pontotrigeminal vein course inside this fissure. During various during variations of the supracerebellar infratentorial approach or occipital transtentorial approach, opening this fissure helps to minimize the need for cerebral retractions and reducing tensions on surrounding vascular structures. When you open the entire fissure and divide it the supermedullary velum, you can access the upper force ventricle. In the superior and the inferior limb of the cerebral pontine fissure, the ica and the vein of the cerebral pontine fissure, the largest branches of the superior vitreous vein courses inside the fissure. In the vertical sigmoid approach, opening the arachnoid along the superior limb of the cerebral pontine fissure provides wide access to the middle cerebral peduncle and the trigeminal nerve. And opening the inferior limb of the cerebral pontine fissure allows the elevation of the floccus and the choroid plexus to expose the root exit zone of the facial nerve and the pontomedullary sulcus deep to the facial nerve. This is a case of cerebral pontine angle epidermoid cyst presenting hearing disturbance. After the suboxtral craniotomy in a park bench position, the petrosal and cerebral pontine fissures were opened to help, help several retractions. We carefully dissected the tumor from surrounding cranial nerves and vessels under neuromonitoring. For long-term tumor control, it is important to achieve maximum removal of not only the cyst content, but also its copser. The fissure opening enables this meticulous copser removal from the brainstem surface under direct visualiz visualization. Above, above the trigeminal nerve, the tumor was separated from the oculomotor nerve, and the complete removal was achieved. Here is the post-op MRI without any residual tumor, and her hearing disturbance also improved from class D before the surgery to class A after the surgery. For such cavernoma at pontomedullary junction, Professor Bertanfi has preferred to use the perifacial zone through the pontomedullary junction via the infrafrocular approach. In the left cerebral pontine angle on semi-sitting position, the lower, the seventh, and the eighth cranial nerves and the superior petrosal vein were dissected meticulously, and the floculus and the colloid plexus were lifted up gently. The root exit zone of the facial nerve was confirmed by electrical stimulation, and through the space between the 10th and the 11th cranial nerves, here you can see the pontomedullary sulcus on which the vein of pontomedullary junction coast. The lesion was located right underneath the puncture and the complete removed well, in piecemeal fashion through a tiny incision on the sulcus was uh, performed. His modified ranking scale improved from four before the surgery to one at recent four up. Since the tonsil is attached only at the superlateral margin as the tonsil peduncle, the cerebral medullary fissure is the biggest fissure in the posterior fossa. We classify this wide space as medial tonsillar space ventral to the tonsil, uvular tonsillar space medial to the tonsil, and the supratonsillar space cranial to the tonsil. The pica makes caudal and cranial loops inside this fissure. The vein of the inferior cerebral peduncle coursing on the tenure is a good landmark to incise the tela along the tenure when opening the first ventricle. The vein of the cerebral medullary fissure coursing near the telovelar junction is a good landmark for determining how far the fissure has been opened when a large tumor occupied this space. The OA pica bypass is usually performed in caudal loop of the pica. 
But if the caudal loop is inconvenient as the recipient, you can use other segments as the alternative recipient by opening the server material feature. This is a woman with a giant distal pica aneurysm compressing the brainstem. The pica formed an aneurysm at its caudal cranial loop without making the caudal loop and descend along the descend it at the medial surface of the tonsil while bifurcating into the vermian and hemispheric trunk. In the pr prone position with head flexion to get a wide space around the occipital cervical junction, we made a zigzag skin incision and the occipital artery was harvested as a donor for later revascularization. The suboxtral muscles were divided from the midline to expose the foramen magnum C1 and C2 and the lateral foramen magnum, including the conjugal fossa, was removed to achieve wide surgical feed around the tonsil. After dual opening, here is the pica origin, and then opening of the cerebellar fissure was started from the foramen of Majandi. Here you can see the vein of the inferior cerebral peduncle and the tela choroidea was cut along the tenia. Now the giant aneurysm was identified. This is a bifurcation of the pica at the medial surface of the tonsil and the distal neck of the aneurysm. The distal pica just before the bifurcation was selected as the bypass recipient and the OA pica and the two side anosmosis was performed. After successful anosmosis, the giant aneurysm was trapped and punctured to relieve the brainstem compression. The post-op MRI and CTA showed no ischemic changes and good patency of the bypass. When I, when I was a resident at the other institution, I experienced a case of petrous apex meningioma. The superior petrosal vein was injured during tumor removal, so we tried to repair it without sacrificing, but the ICZ showed no venous flow despite our effort to preserve it. On the day after surgery, the patient had several hemorrhagic infarction, and from this experience, I realized the importance of venous system. The superior petrosal vein, the biggest vein in the cerebral pontine angle, is usually consists of four main tributaries. We often talk about how to preserve the superior petrosal vein, but we also have to think about the superior petrosal sinus, the only drainage root of the petrosal vein. During this research, we found that incomplete type of this sinus was more common than we expected. They are the lateral type only connecting to the sigmoid sinus and the medial type only connecting to the cavernous sinus. This is an epidermoid cyst in the cerebral point and angle we, and we plan the combined transpetrosal approach for complete removal of not only the cyst component, but also the capsule. Angiogram showed the the superior petrosal sinus had only a connection to the sigmoid sinus without, sacri without a connection to the cavernous sinus. In such case, cutting the sinus lateral to the petrosal vein entry can lose the venous drainage route. So we plan to cut the sinus medial to the entry of the petrosal vein. In a park bench position, after temporal and suboxtral craniotomies, the cosmetic mastoidectomy was performed. We drilled out the mastoid air cells to expose the mastoid antrum. And the sigmoid sinus was skeletonized and dissected from the posterior side. The mastoid emissary vein was precisely coagulated. And at the middle fossa, we dissected the greater superficial petrosal nerve cut the middle meningeal artery and the dissected the V3 to expose and drill the petrous apex, which is the so-called Kawase's triangle. After completing the retrolab mastoidectomy, the pre-sigmoid 
was incised along the sigmoid and superior petrosal sinuses, and the middle fossa dura was also incised along the superior petrosal sinus. Before cutting the tentorium, we identified the superior petrosal vein encased by the tumor, and medial to the entry point, the superior petrosal sinus was ligated and transected, paying great attention to prevent damage to the fifth and the fourth cranial nerves. After schist component removal, you, you can see the fourth cranial nerves, the trigeminal nerve, and the petrosal vein. Here is the facial and vestibular cochlear nerves, and the abducens nerve. The thin tumor capsule was accurately removed without tearing the membrane to prevent later recurrence of the tumor. After opening the Michael's cave, the tumor inside the Michael's cave was also removed. Now you can see the basilar artery, lower cranial nerves, the posterior communicating arteries, and oculomotor nerves. Here is the petrosal vein preserved. The patient had no permanent neurological deficit or recurrence during follow-up, and you can see adequate drainage of the superior petrosal vein through the superior petrosal sinus. When planning the combined transpetrosal approach, we also have to watch the venous drainage in the middle fossa. In this case of the petrocrival meningioma, the cervian vein drained into the foramen novale as the spinovasal vein, and the spinopetrosal vein draining into the superior petrosal sinus coast on the middle skull base. To preserve these venous drainage, we need modified techniques of lifting the middle fossa dular. In a park bench position, we perform the cosmetic mastoidectomy, expose the mastoid antrum, and skeletonize the sigmoid sinus. The mastoid emissary vein was coagulated and the sigmoid sinus was exposed. After the mastoidectomy, the temporal dula was incised while taking care not to damage the vein of lape. The sphenobasal vein was carefully dissected from the temporal lobe to lift the temporal lobe subdullally without sacrificing the vein. After identifying the GSPN by electrical stimulation, the middle base dula was incised posterior to the foramen ovale to preserve the sphenobasal vein. The petrous apex was exposed by lifting up only posterior part of the middle fossa dula, and the anterior petrosectomy was performed as usual. After ligating the superior petrosal sinus, the tentorium was cut and the pressing medulla was also opened. Here are the seven and eight cranial nerves and opening the Michael's cave helped mobilization of the trigeminal nerve. We started the tumor removal, and here is the PCA and contralateral oculomotor nerve on the cranial side. Basilar artery and ICA on the medial side. And the left abducens nerve was so thin, and the tumor around the Dorelos canal and its intracavernous portion were left, considering the surgical risks and the patient's age. The patient had no permanent neurological deficit or tumor regulose during follow-up. Management of massive bleeding by the sinus injury is a good example of what I learned directly in the OR. There are several calvaric models with flow circulation to simulate this situation but still, I feel we need enough experience in the OR to be able to calmly manage this emergent complication. The small injury can be repaired 
sufficiently by bipolar coagulation or fibrillin glue-soaked hemostatic fabric. But if it is larger, the sinus wall should be reconstructed to maintain its long-term patency. This is a case of vestibular schwannoma and we got significant bleeding during the exposure of the posterior edge of the sigmoid sinus. So we temporarily con controlled the bleeding with a large cotton sheet and widely exposed the injury site while avoiding additional sinus contusion. It was about three millimeter tear, so we sutured it for sinus wall reconstruction. After the repairment, we confirmed the adequate flow of the sinus by an ultrasonic Doppler. The patient had any symptoms after the surgery, and the postoperative MRI confirmed good patency of the sinus. In this case of cerebral pontine angle meningioma, we carefully exposed the injury site and found that the laceration was unsuturable. So we made a fibrillin glue sheet and patched the Gore-Tex membrane to the injury. This procedure enables prompt sinus wall repair without using a hemostatic agent as the reconstructed sinus wall to avoid any potential risks of thrombus formation and delayed sinus occlusion. Here is three-year three year follow-up MRV showed good patency of the reconstructed sinus. The neural monitoring techniques is also what I learned in the OR from Professor Kono. Rerunning spontaneous electromyography can reveal the mechanical stimulation to the nerve in real time, but cannot quantitatively assess neural function. Intermittent neural st stimulation using a handheld probe or transcranial stimulation enables quantitative assessment of neural function, but real-time alerts are not possible because we have to stop the surgery to check this monitoring. To overcome these disadvantages and to enable real-time and quantitative evaluation of neural function throughout the microsurgical procedure, we developed a continuous monitoring system. In this vestibular schwannoma surgery, after the retrosigmoid craniotomy, the proximal facial nerve was confirmed by intermittent stimulation. A ball type monopolar stimulating electrode was placed on the facial nerve, and the tumor removal was started while monitoring the evoked facial electromyograms at a frequency of 1 Hz and the surgeon is alerted in real time whenever a change in amplitude or waveform occurs. Even during osseous drilling, we, we were able to monitor the evoked facial electromyograms every second. Inside the acoustic meatus, an electrically activated dissector was used to localize the facial nerve. We meticulously separated the tumor from the facial, cochlear, and superior vestibular nerves using a dissector, forceps, and micro scissors while preserving the membrane derived from the vestibular nerves, including the perineal realm. The AVR was continuously monitored without any changes throughout the intracranial procedure. Near total resection was achieved and the amplitude of the facial electromyograms were preserved at more than 85% of those before the tumor removal. Over 50% uh, amplitude preservation rate and over one millivolt final maximum amplitude were the warning criterion for avoiding postoperative facial nerve palsy. She didn't experience any facial or hearing deterioration. This monitoring technique can be also utilized during temporal bone surgery. In this surgery for a glomus jugular tumor involving the fallopian canal, we performed cosmetic mastoidectomy 
and the ball type electrode was placed and the ball type electrode was now placed around the second guinea of the facial nerve through the mastoid antrum. Under one health monitoring, as like the previous vestibular schwannoma surgery, we completely rejected all the tumor around the facial nerve. And inside the jaguar foramen without causing any post-operative facial nerve palsy. In the surgery for this schwannoma extending into the upper jaguar foramen, a recording monopolar needle was inserted into the soft palate before starting the surgery. After the retrosig craniotomy, we identified accessory and vagus nerve using intermittent stimulation on the caudal surface of the tumor. A ball type electrode was placed on the proximal vagus nerve and the evokes vagus nerve electromyograms were continuously monitored by one health direct stimulation, even during ultrasonic aspiration or cell drilling. The tumor inside the upper jaguar foramen was rejected through the suprajagular approach. In this case, the vagus nerve, the vagus nerve was widely adhered to the caudal surface of the tumor, and we got the warning by the spontaneous electromyographic activity and the amplitude decrease of the continuous monitoring. So we decided to leave a thin layer of the tumor and the finished surgical resection. We also use this technique for monitoring abducens nerve. This case is an epidermoid cyst involving the abducens nerve. Through the retro sigmoid approach, we started the continuous facial nerve monitoring and opened the pedrosal fissure as like previous cases. The tumor was rejected under one health facial nerve electromyograms. And after exposing the proximal abducens nerve, we placed the ball type electrode on it. The tumor and its capsule around the abducens nerve was carefully rejected under monitoring extraocular electromyograms every second. In the orbital surgery, we also trying continuous monitoring of the extraocular muscles. This is an orbital SFT adhered to the superior and lateral rectus muscles. After the craniotomy, the ball type of electrode was placed on the superior orbital fissure and the tumor was dissected from the globe superior lectus muscles and the lectus, lateral rectus muscles and the VP and the continuous monitoring of the extraocular muscles. The tumor was completely rejected without any neurological deficit. In this presentation, I introduced what I learned in the lab and what, what I had learned in the OR during my training days. I hope this talk can help many young neurosurgeons in some way. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ken. Uh, I think this is the uh, best uh, cadaveric studies of the uh, skull base and very nice case. Congratulations of uh, these wonderful cases. And I always... Uh, still going to laboratory before cases. I think uh, you still use your laboratory. Uh, and one question from Harshad Parekh. Uh, do you think injury to sinus was complete transection as most of the time sinus injury is controlled by simple hemolytic agent, mild pressure and head elevation? I think uh, if it is possible, uh, you are agree with him. What do you think? Thank you. Thank you very much for your good question. Um, as I showed my slide, um, the small injury or small laceration can be controlled by bipolar coagulation or hemostatic fabric with the head elevation as 
he mentioned. But if it, the injury is large, it's a little bit difficult to stop the bleeding only by the hemostatic agent. And what we worried about is the long-term patency of the sinus. If you reconstruct the sinus wall by hemo hem hemostatic agent, it might cause the thrombus formation and it can cause the sinus occlusion. That's why we prefer not to use the hemo hemostatic agent to reconstruct the sinus wall when the laceration is large. If the, if the laceration is small, it's okay, I think. Thank you very much. Do you have any comment, uh, Mr. Sumit? Professor Sinha? Yeah, excellent demonstration of the technique and uh, beautiful illustration of the anatomy, uh, Dr. Ken. It was really highly impressive. Uh, uh, just, uh, uh, I have two uh, uh, comments, maybe, yes. Uh, regarding this uh, uh, repair of the damaged sinus during the surgery, um, uh, it's really, uh, I mean, uh, every effort should be made to primarily repair the sinus because of the concerns of the long-term patency of the sinus. However, there are not, may not be some situations in which this uh, technique might work, as you very clearly showed. In that case, we might have to uh, resort to the hemostatic agents. So my question is, what sort of hemostatic agent, if you have to apply, is very works favorably or suitably in these circumstances with least risk of sinus thrombosis later on? Uh, you mean when we use the hemostatic agent, which kind of hemostatic yes. agent can yes. um, minimize the risk of the yes. sinus occlusion? I'm, I'm actually i'm i'm sorry i'm not sure about that you know there are a lot of kinds of hemostatic agents like surge cell gel form surge, uh, sponge gel um i have never compared in the laboratory setting or clinical setting so i cannot answer this question i'm so sorry that that's why we use the gore-tex which is which cannot cause the thrombus formation okay and, thank uh, you very much for your question. Thank you. My my second quick comment is uh, I really liked your continuous monitoring of the facial nerve through the stimulator inserted into the nerve. So uh, uh, unfortunately, we don't have it uh, as of now in our uh, armamentarium. So we what we use is um, uh, un unwarranted stimulation of the facial nerve during the surgeries. Um, so if uh, the unwarranted stimulation of the facial nerve happens, then we stop at that point and uh, uh, don't uh, do the unnecessary handling of the nerve in that area and we wait for some time. So, but this continuous monitoring is a very beautiful uh, technique that uh, I would really love to have in my, my OR, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Professor, uh, Professor Nayers visited our hospital several times, so he may know how to get the, the monitoring devices in your country. Oh, <laughs> that's, I, I will catch up along with him. Yes. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you very much for your comment. Thank and you. I think Dr. Ben has some comments and or questions. Yes. Hello. Hello. Uh, hello, Dr. Ken. And uh, I'm Ben from Hong Kong of the Young New Surgeon as well. And I really agree with your idea that we need to translate what we learn from the laboratory into a clinical practice and uh and i really like your uh, the the skull based uh concepts that you learn from uh, uh that you learn from the laboratory so my my question is uh, first is about the drilling of the jugular tubercle so um uh i encounter several cases that uh, we we try to drill the jugular uh, tubercles but as a beginner i I want to get some tips from you that uh, so usually how how would you approach the jugular tubercle and uh, how uh, how do you know that uh, it could be uh, adequately drilled and uh, do you uh, use uh, navigation or any anatomical landmarks? Uh, 
that uh, we can appreciate uh, to to when you consider doing the jugular tubercle. Also, uh, do you find the mobilization of the vertebral artery uh, necessary when you are doing um, uh, approach, for example, far lateral or when you do the um, uh, jugular tubercle? So another question is also about uh, the approach to jugular foramen, about the jugular block. So, uh, would you um, how uh, how would you uh, handle the sinus injury um, at the jugular bulb? So, any tips uh, for 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 the young neurosurgeons? <coughs> thank you. Um, thank you very much for your con questions about the about the drilling of the jugular tubercle. You mean the extracranial drilling? Of the jugular tubercle, yes. such as the condylar fossa approach, or yes, yes, like like the case which I showed mm, uh, yes. of the ventral foramen magnum meningioma, yes. right? Yes, uh, the posterior con condylar vein is the best landmark, and it is the only landmark I think. The no posterior problem. condylar vein is causing an anteriorly and carved to join the sigma jugular venous system. Mm. So when you drilled following the posterior conjugal vein, you can drill on here, right? Mm. In the most case, I think that's enough to drill out. You don't need to drill uh, anterior to the conjugal vein, uh, the hypogrossal canal in the, in the mm. most cases, right? So we yeah. usually use this posterior conjugal vein as a round mark like this. And medial to the posterior conjugal vein is the most important part to drill out. And also, if you have to remove the tumor, such as hypogrossal schwannoma, Inside the hypoglossal canal, you have to drill a little bit more to open the hypoglossal canal. Mm. All right. But uh, but the anterior to the posterior conjugal vein, actually, you do not have any landmarks mm. during the drilling. So the navigation is one of the good so good device to help you, right? Right. And the the about the super juggler approach, even in the vestibular schwannomal surgery, sometimes you need to uh, manipulate the high juggler bulb during the transmetal approach, right? Yes. Sometimes if, if the high juggler bulb is very developed, you have to expose the wall of the juggler bulb and compressed and then by compressed it to mm. to achieve the surgical field inside the acoustic meters. Mm. So I think it might be a similar procedure with the superjugular approach, right? And usually we do not use the navigation system during the superjugular approach because there is a lot of not landmarks like mm. intrajugular process, uh, acoustic meatus, and lymphatic sac. Mm. So you can get enough landmarks inside the cerebral pontine angle. So we usually not use the navigation system during that approach. But if it's complex tumor, especially extending into the extracranial extension, then we need the, we use the navigation system. Mm. So, um, uh, concerning the navigation, uh, sometimes uh, if you register, uh, be, because it, uh, sometimes tumor extend into the leg, just uh, mm -hmm. as you mm -hmm. mentioned about mm -hmm. navigation. So when you turn the head, the, the leg portion mm -hmm. may, may not be accurate. Do, yes. do you experience that? That's yeah. true. Yeah. So and also we, how, yeah. In, yeah. intra -op C MRI or intra-op CT scan is the best to re-register re re the navigation system 
but un- unfortunately we do not have that <laughs> yeah yes same just so uh, may i also ask uh, when 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 would you mobilize the vertical archery ah sorry yeah um i think we do not have so many cases which we have to mobilize the vertebral archery mm. um last month we have the surgery of Stevan Schwanomar and it's huge and compressing all the course of vertebral artery. So after the tumor resection, it's like kind of vertebral artery mobi- mobilization. But if the 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 lesion is inside the tumor inside the cranium or or a tonal junction, we usually do not need the vertebral artery mobilization. Hmm. Understand. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Yeah. Is there any uh, doctor Islam? You can ask your question or comments. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for your brilliant presentation. Uh, I am seeking a suggestion from you. Uh, in our country, uh, where I live in is Bangladesh. Uh, most of the patient come as with huge vestibular sonoma or most of the skull tumor very large. Uh, in spite of being using null monitor, uh, we can f- uh, find out that the uh, seven k nerve is thinned out. And uh, it's difficult to peel out the total tumor to preserve the facial nerve. And what is your uh, suggestion uh, for safe removal of the tumor preserving the facial nerve, in this case, a very large vestibular sonoma. Thank you. Thank you very much. The, the, we think the neuromonitoring is essential for preserving the facial nerve function. And for that continuous monitoring, the uh, identifying the proximal facial nerve is the first step for starting the continuous monitoring. We have to place the ball type electrode on the proximal facial nerves to start the continuous monitoring. So if it is, even if it is huge, um, if it is huge, we sometimes we have to uh, start the internal decompilation without starting the continuous monitoring, but only the caudal side of the tumor, internal, de- <coughs> internal decompression of the caudal side of the tumor can uh, retroact the tumor and it helps to identify the facial nerve. So we try to find the facial nerve as much, as fast as possible. That, I think that's the best, the most important steps to preserve how the, the facial nerve function. Uh, can we start from uh, drilling the internal acoustic meters uh, where we can find out the facial nerve easily? In a small tumor with hear, uh, such as hearing preservation surgery, we sometimes start with internal acoustic meters drilling. But in a huge tumor, we never start with drilling because we want to start the continuous monitoring. And to con- start continuous monitoring, we have to st- catch the proximal facial nerve. So we always start to catch the proximal facial nerve. So uh, in most of the cases, we left some tumor behind that is firmly attached to facial nerve. I think Mm -hmm. it is okay, right? Yes, we have to try to remove the tumor as much as possible, but, but you know, the gamma knife surgery and any other large surgery, now it they have a, um, they got a good result. Uh, I mean, still, we cannot say it's enough long-term uh, tumor control, but, but we have other, we have to, we always have to, uh, Remind, we have other option than surgery, right? Yeah. Even like you great. can, if, even you left some tumor, <clears throat> you can send this patient to the radio surgery, or you can uh, try 
the the second surgery. So the the what we have to avoid is to damage the facial nerve. I think. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, as a last comment, uh, Professor Simha. Uh, yes, uh, this was in reference to the question uh, asked by Dr. Islam uh, regarding the uh, large giant acoustic tumors or giant CP angle tumors and, and preservation of the facial nerve in these tumors. So, uh, I mean, it's sometimes it's very difficult. I do agree with uh, Dr. Islam in this in in this case and uh, to save the facial nerve. And in the present scenario, with all the technological advancements, it is imperative to preserve the facial function because it is disastrous to the patient socially after the surgery. Uh, having said this, um, the philosophy of the caustic tumor surgery is that it is an intraarachnoidal surgery. So uh, I, it, it certain things have to be kept in mind during the uh, surgery of these tumors like uh, uh, bipolar is an absolute no-no during the surgery, especially when you are in the initial stages of your decompression of the tumor. You, so what you do is uh, you decompress a tumor during using your CUSA and then sweep the arachnoidal membranes of the capsule of the tumor and most of the neurovascular structure, they are absolutely outside this interarachnoidal membrane. And same is the philosophy with the petroclival meningiomas, howsoever big they are. So uh, once you decompress, I'm talking about acoustic tumors here. Once you decompress, the tumor capsule becomes more manageable and so that you can sweep these uh, arachnoid membranes off the tumor capsule. And then there you come to see uh, the facial nerve by using the oral stimulator. This stimulator is an absolute essential mandatory requirement for the caustic tumor surgery if you want to preserve the facial nerve, especially in large tumors. Now, having said all this thing about the caustic tumor surgery facial preservation, I do not anytime uh, think twice about leaving the tumor, a bit of tumor over the facial now. If I do have to, I will leave it. But my topmost priority is saving the facial now. As Dr. Zen, Dr. Ken very correctly said that nowadays, gamma knife and radi radiation protocols are so well advanced, they can take care of this a small bit of tissue. And this will be a wonderful service to the patient rather than you giving uh, him or her a facial palsy all throughout the life. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for your comments. And Ken, thanks again. Uh, also, I think you will come to the Turkey in August. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll pass the next session. Uh, do you want to give any concluding uh, remark, Professor Abuzo? Uh, yes. Uh, I think without uh, knowing the normal anatomy, it is impossible. Yeah, it is uh, not difficult. It is uh, most, most impossible uh, to remove this kind of tumor uh, in these regions uh, because this, there, uh, there is a very complicated uh, anatomy and uh, also vascular structures and neural structures. And without studying in the laboratory, in my opinion, we mm, we mustn't touch these areas. What do you think, Ken? I totally agree, and that's why we studied it together at Dr. Rotten's lab, right? Thank, thank, you, thank you. Thank you, Professor Abuso, and and definitely we'd like to thank uh, Professor Ken uh, for very. Uh, delicate uh, surgery is, is uh, defining what is uh, micro neurosurgery is all about and uh, and and thank you uh, for a very lively discussion for the first uh, session now we would like to move on to the second session I would like to call upon uh, Professor Asra to introduce our yes. second speaker Professor okay thank you Dr. Liu and also uh, the HNS it is as it is an honor for me to attend this uh, webinar and chair this uh, second session in this webinar. And uh, we will have uh, an expert from India, Professor Sumit Sinha, uh, that uh, he will uh, present his experience about the surgical minimally, minimally invasive approach 
especially in neurosurgery. As you know that uh, minimally invasive approach is now getting popular in neurosurgery and many research, many reports so that it has uh, many advantage for the patient, less surgical risk, less, less timing, uh, uh, less retraction and many, many things else. So I think this is very important for especially our young neurosurgeon to study this approach because I think this is a future uh, for uh, our neurosurgery. So uh, I think uh, we'll have a presentation from Professor Sumit Sinha. I hope uh, he will give us many, you know, many new uh, uh, knowledge uh, and especially about the basic concept of this key hill approach. So, Professor Sinha, can I share this, please? Yes. Okay, thank you so much uh, for uh, uh, that uh, wonderful introduction and giving me the uh, opportunity to present my humble uh, experience about uh, this. Uh, a new paradigm in neurosurgery that is the keyhole uh, concept and that is all about uh, surgical minimalism in neurosurgery nowadays and um, uh, having said that uh, this is an era of um, uh, of uh, minimalism in in everything and neurosurgery it especially matters because um, it is of uh, uh, a great uh, benefit and uh, to the patient and it improves the surgical outcome as well and uh, in this uh, subsequent presentation of mine, uh, I will take you through uh, uh, through the uh, uh, the application of these minimalistic approaches in neurosurgery as to how they do work and uh, what um, to uh, how to do them and how do I do basically. And my talk will be specifically restricted to mostly the keyhole concept and uh, endoscopic uh, assisted as well as uh, endoscopic approaches. Uh, in treatment of various uh, uh, neurosurgical um, uh, lesions uh, in the brain. So uh, I have no financial disclosures to do. And uh, to start with, I would like to uh, say that uh, the keyhole or endoscopic neurosurgery, uh, what it is all about is uh, we can, we have three different techniques of, uh, uh, of uh, minimalistic neurosurgery. Uh, which we can apply to our patients and uh, out of which uh, uh, one is the endopod surgery in which you take inside the uh, the telescope and then you navigate the instruments through this telescopic channel and then you remove the or treat the offending pathology through this channel. So this is what is called as endopod surgery and the benefit of this endopod surgery is that you see the things then going inside uh, into the brain very very close to the lesion so that uh, the things get all magnified and it gives an excellent panoramic view of the offending pathology and the adjacent critical neurovascular structures which you can save during your uh, uh, operative uh, procedure. Next comes is the keyhole surgery which I will be talking about more in detail in the subsequent presentation. And in this, what you do is you make a very, very small uh, craniotomy through which you access uh, the various uh, deeply, spatially deeply situated lesions. And I will elaborate it further, as I already said. And third, the last but not the least is in the armamentarium of a um, minimalistic neurosurgeon nowadays is the endonasal surgery, where the whole of the surgery is done uh, through the and uh, taking the endoscope through the natural orifice, the nose, and uh, the, the entire skull base uh, plethora of the uh, uh, pathologies can be dealt with by doing these endonasal surgery. So in this time, let me see as to how much I do cover about all these uh, minimalistic approaches in neurosurgery. And to start with, uh, I will uh, share my experience with the endoport. And uh, uh, the most common operation which is performed, especially in uh, children, is the endoscopic third ventriculostomy. And what you do is this is uh, basically for congenital obstructive hydrocephalus, as you all know about it. And uh, here you see this was um, a child uh, who came with uh, obstructed uh, balloon ventricles and there was an acutectal stenosis um, there, as you can see in the representative image of the MRI. And this was um, accomplished using the LOTA ventriculoscope system. 
and uh, this is uh, the view that you get and uh, taking this endoscopic uh, system inside through a one centimeter burr hole um, and we can uh, uh, make the patient uh, absolutely symptomatic free and uh, uh, there, 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 there is further no need for a shunt procedure you can see the fenestration of the uh, membrane uh, which is uh, uh, sitting uh, right across the uh, um, the the uh, uh, which is obstructing the flow and uh, they, thereby creating an, op an, an optional alternative opening and there you'll see the basilar artery the second membrane also perforated uh, and with the good flow across the communication made at the base of the third ventricular so uh, and then at the end then you turn the uh, uh, ventricular scope behind to see the aqueduct also which is uh, with the void of any membranes if there are any then you can break those membranes as well uh, after the surgery so this is what uh, you can uh, do with this uh, uh, this is a 15 minute procedure and uh, this is easily accomplished and uh, uh, the child uh, or the patient uh, gets rid of uh, a permanent shunt system inside the body another example of uh, where you can use an endopot or a lot of ventriculoscope system is um, uh, is this loculated hydrocephalus or multiseptated hydrocephalus which is frequently the result of uh, an infection in the past and there you see this is uh, the uh, cyst uh, which is communicating maybe with the ventricular system but the communication is not very adequate so what we did is um, we took the endoscope inside the cyst through this direction making a small bur hole the lotta system is taken inside and uh, a communication is made this is the uh, cyst wall which is communicating with the ventricle and this communication is made into the uh, lateral ventricular system so uh, as to uh, make a, a thorough passage and, and ensuring the drainage of the circulation of the csf and uh, another similar example was uh, of this young gentleman who came to us many years after the AVM season in this area. And he had persistent headache and diplopia as symptoms. And uh, we took the lot of ventricular scope inside and break, broke down all the membranes and uh, established a communication of the cysts through the ventricular system. And these two MRI, which you are seeing is one year down the follow-up absolute resolution of the cyst cavity and which uh, was draining completely now into the ventricle system and the another example is this beautiful uh, neurocystic circle cyst which was sitting here um, this patient, uh, a young lady, came to us with a headache and uh, 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 sixth nerve palsy, uh, uh, which uh, was uh, uh, dealt with by taking the endoscope uh, uh, inside. The lotta system was taken again inside. And then you see the grasper over here and the dancing beautiful cyst over here, which was easily grabbed. It's a very simple surgery and then 15-minute job. And then you can get the patient rid of, of the disabling symptoms. Uh, taking out the cyst in a nice manner. So this is my uh, humble experience of the uh, with the endoport, and it's a beautiful technique, very beautiful surgical minimal uh, minimalistic technique, and uh, have all the spectrum of um, third ventriculostomy, colloid cyst, multiseptate, hydrocephalus, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I had my share of complications as well with the endoport, with the meningitis and seal CHF leak in one case through the wound, which was managed by reapplying the sutures and um, um, and um, putting the patient on diamox and mesilectone and uh, uh, things like that. So now coming to the keyhole approach, which will be uh, the main part of my presentation is, uh, and uh, now let's let's have a look of uh, about as to what the keyhole concept is. Now this concept was first uh, brought to the world by this uh, wonderful uh, surgeon and wonderful human being, Alex Pernaski. All of us might be knowing him here. And I met this gentleman first in Amman, Jordan, and in in two thousand in in the year two thousand seven or eight, I think. And um, uh, he gave this concept of uh, reducing the size of the craniotomy to a small incision. Now this is a minimum craniotomy which is required to access a deep intracranial pathology. So there is no definite size of this craniotomy. It is a minimum suitable craniotomy which 
uh, our surgeon is comfortable in operating the deep pathologies. These are the two triatis now which this wonderful surgeon wrote. And unfortunately, we are not anymore having him with us now as um, he passed away um, uh, about a few years back. But the legacy which he has given is uh, goes on along with all uh, in the neurosurgical fraternity. So another gentleman is uh, this Charlie, uh, a wonderful human being and good friend of mine. I learned uh, seeing his technique and uh, um, all kudos to him that he developed this uh, uh, specialty of keyhole. And another one, Prof. Koto from Osaka University, a wonderful human being and gentleman from uh, Japan, Osaka, Japan, and uh, uh, marvelous surgeon with the keyhole techniques and endoscopic assisted techniques. Having said this, let's have a look about as to what the concept is now. The concept is that it gives us an inverted funnel vision. It's just like looking the entire room through the keyhole through a small opening. And now since it is a small opening, hence, and it is immobile having placed in the in skull, it has to be very, very carefully placed. It has to be appropriately uh, placed over up, over over upper area where you can approach, where you can maneuver where you can reach the deeply seated intracranial pathology. Hence, and navigation guidance is an absolute must in planning and putting up this uh, keyhole in your surgical procedure. Another characteristic of this keyhole is that it has a mobile viewing trajectory. You can have wide and multiple angles of vision through the keyhole. So it is a versatile um, view when you look inside through the keyhole. It's a reverse funnel shaped uh, view where, whereas in the microscope, you have a funnel shape view where it is broader outside, broader superficially and goes on tapering down as the deeper pathology uh, reaches. So um, it offers uh, several advantages. Uh, of course, there is no restriction of your manipulation of your hand movements through the keyhole if it is appropriately placed over the pathology. Now, where the uh, way to make the keyhole, the best approach is along the long axis of the tumor. As you can see, this was one of the telemic gliomas which I operated uh, lately. And um, uh, you, what you do is you draw uh, two, uh, two points along the long axis of the tumor and then uh, extend these two points to the surface where they reach the shortest route. So in this case, it was reaching through this and um, hence a small burr hole was made about two centimeters uh, 1.5 centimeters craniotomy was made in this area <coughs> and, uh, and this is the post -op, immediate post-op CT scan. You see the complete tumor excision uh, through this. Now, the exception to this rule is that when the lesion lies uh, perpendicular to the uh, to the long axis. So, uh, of course, and, and, and when there is an eloquent area exactly overlying the uh, tumor. So, you can't, of course, penetrate the eloquent area and reach the tumor. So, you have to alter your strategy and then you have to go in from somewhere else where uh, the whole extent of the tumor tissue can cover up through that keyhole. Uh, however, there are certain lecture also which uh, have to be kept in mind. Uh, now, since this is a keyhole, hence it is not good for looking at the back of the door, uh, meaning thereby that this is not good for uh, superficially located lesions. Now, um, uh, like convexity meningiomas, of course, we can't think of making a keyhole yet to cover the entire aspect of the tumor tissue. Uh, another good thing about this keyhole is that in normal craniotomy, you have a massive exposure of the brain and uh, long hours of surgery with the heat and the thermal damage with the with the light of the microscope you can uh, uh, you can place a significant amount of damage to important neurovascular structures in the cortical structures so in this keyhole craniotomy the exposure is very less and um, uh, the uh, the exposure of the cortical tissue to the thermal damage is very very minimized and this adds to the uh, uh, to the beautiful surgical outcome of your patient after the surgery. As I said, neuro navigation is an absolute must uh, in the pre-operative planning and making and fashioning of this placement of this keyhole uh, before you do the surgery. Second wonderful tool in uh, assisting your surgical technique, surgical procedure is the endoscope. And this beautiful tool can be used to visualize around the corners where the straight light of microscope cannot go, you can use angled endoscopes to look into the nooks and corners of the uh, tumor tissue and take out the tumor tissue from those areas. 
So uh, having given this brief background about the keyhole concept, now let us see as to how we can utilize this into our clinical practice uh, and the surgery. So um, I'll be taking you through a series of approaches as to how we can use it during our surgery. Now starting with the subtemporal Kawase approach. Now this Kawase approach is uh, can be dealt with by conventional um, uh, big incisions as well and uh, by a small craniotomy uh, keyhole op also uh, <clears throat> as I generally do it for the last decade maybe now. So the conventional skull based approach is taking example of petroclival meningiomas previously and even now they've been dealt with by huge conventional skull based flaps but uh, in my experience the keyhole approaches to petroclival meningiomas are divided into two types uh, either the subtemporal kawase or the retrosig approach which are the workhorse approaches for uh, uh, these uh, formidable tumors and the uh, advantage of these keyhole approaches we all know about it they are less approach related morbidity less time consuming and better cost matches of course the wound heals better with these approaches as compared to large skin flaps large skull based flaps that we used to do earlier so uh, let us have a look as to how it goes with the keyhole this is one such petroclaval meningioma operated by a subtemporal route and this is the post op scan which is complete tumor excision and uh, this is the patient now this uh, this was immediate uh, post-op, having some tension of symptoms that you can see on the right side. And uh, now this is the patient after six months of the surgery. It's the absolute feeling of the fifth nerve, returning back to um, uh, or to the normal sensation, and uh, uh, and uh, the, the, the patient is free of the tumor tissue and the symptoms also. Petroclaval meningioma, another one, and this is the angle of attack. This is the craniotomy, which was done immediate post-op CT scan, which shows complete tumor excision through this keyhole approach. And this is the patient, which is uh, devoid of any uh, cranial of third, fourth, and sixth and the fifth now without any uh, neurological deficit in the post-op follow-up after six months. Uh, another petroclival and the same angle of attack, this is the keyhole craniotomy and I will be taking you through a short surgical video of this lady soon. And um, this is the immediate uh, post-op scan, you see complete tumor excision and this is the preserved yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, you see the yeah. nerve and the sixth nerve which is absolutely preserved after the immediately after the surgery another is phenopetroclival meningioma which i recently operated this is the post-op scan now um, this is the importance of now this patient was slightly moribund when she came she had a high blood urea levels and um, she had fifth nerve palsy and the uh, uh, was not in a very good shape so we had to get rid of this tumor tissue uh, uh, and um, so that to release to relieve the patient of her mass effect symptoms so we did a uh, uh, less than total resection of this tumor having known that nowadays gamma knife and the radiation protocols are uh, beautifully uh, uh, advantageous and uh, they uh, in, uh, they enhance the surgical outcome of these patients Another similar uh, dumbbell shaped petroclaval meningioma, which I recently operated, the size of the craniotomy, and this is the uh, again done through the same subtemporal interdural Kawase approach. Uh, and, uh, and this is the post op scan of the patients uh, showing complete tumor rejection. Yes, all here. Patient with yeah, white yeah, scar, yeah, yeah. just not today yeah. in the OPD. Yeah. With with with. See us all. No, no, no. It goes. It goes. Brother. With with a twenty percent loss in the P1 V2, and uh, this is the twenty percent loss on the V1 uh, and V2. This patient came to us with on the left side. Now this process is already improving within ten days of surgery. And uh, the eye movements you will see they are preserved. They are so well preserved. So uh, uh, this is uh, uh, all about keyhole, and uh, I want to uh, show you a small. Uh, now this is the size of this in season, and this was the lesion. And uh, making a keyhole craniotomy, you have to be very careful about the bony landmarks. Uh, you have to expose the anterior and the posterior end of the posterior root of the zygoma because this is your your area of bony drilling. This is where the cavasi rhomboid will be there about three centimeters down from here. So uh, you have to adequately expose this area 
and remove the muscles from this area and then prepare your craniotomy accordingly. And this is the, uh, uh, the conventional uh, Kawase approach, which, was, uh, which we all do. Uh, the intervertebral dissection, and this is the um, uh, LSP and GSPN, and uh, the Kawase rhomboid ready for drilling, and uh, absolutely no depth of space. Uh, the the thing which you do with a normal large skin flap, you always can do with a absolutely uh, precise manner in a small keyhole approach. The intraarachnoidal surgery, the, do the devascularization of the tumor in the meningioma, do the decompression, and then sweep the membrane, the arachnoid membrane off away from the tumor, saving the important cranial nerves. You see the PCA there, you see the uh, arachnoid, the decompression of the tumor tissue. And this is the, again, PCA doing the sharp dissection here and uh, basilar artery, tumor being lifted up from the basilar artery. This is the retrogas fifth. And uh, again, decompressing, making it more mobile, making it more manageable. This is the, this is the almost end of the surgery and uh, basilar artery and all neurovascular structures absolutely intact at the end of the surgery. So uh, a huge petroclival now, again, a subtemporal kawase. This patient came to us from somewhere outside. You can see uh, the retro uh, second season, which was attempted outside, but uh, uh, unfortunately uh, were not able to uh, remove the tumor in entirety. And uh, what we did was, again, our keyhole subtemporal, and you can see that this is complete um, tumor resection. And uh, this patient had uh, a stormy post, of course, uh, because the uh, capsule was tightly adhered to the, uh, to the uh, brain stem and there were areas where there was no um, good plane between the tumor tissue and the brain stem. So, but uh, ultimately uh, did manage to uh, discharge uh, uh, and this is still in the follow-up uh, um, uh, successfully. The uh, trigeminal schwannoma. Now, this is a beautiful tumor where uh, the only approach is the intradural, uh, intradural approach. And uh, what you do is this is uh, most of the time, this is a purely extradural or I would say an intradural approach. And uh, the tumor itself creates its space along, uh, and you need not do anything except lifting the in, uh, and creating the intradural space and removing and sucking out the tumor tissue. This is the MRI, which you see after one year of the surgery. And this is a beautiful young lady from uh, abroad uh, with a small incision now living a successful, married, happy life. Now coming to the retrosig approach, uh, taking uh, you again to the vestibular schwannoma surgery. It's a beautiful surgery, as I said, and uh, taking advantage of the endoscope while drilling the internal acoustic meatus is a beautiful exercise. And there you see, this is the endoscopic view of the lower cranial nerves. This is the um, seventh nerve here and the fifth nerve. You see petrosal vein after the successful removal of the uh, tumor tissue. You can use your endoscope to remove the tumor tissue from the internal meatus after you drill it. And uh, as I said, um, facial nerve preservation is an absolute priority and nowadays and um, whatsoever, if you, even if you have to leave this big amount of a tumor tissue behind, it's always worth it to save the fascia. Now you see the fascia nerve at the back. Uh, uh, let me, this is the fascia nerve. Uh, uh, just a minute. There you, there you see. There, this is the patient now, which is going behind a thin veil of arachnoid membrane. So here I choose to stop and the patient now is, is stimulable and very well uh, uh, functioning. These are the best post-op patient, immediate post-op of, 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 of the acoustic neuroma patient with intact facial nerve and uh, uh, a facial function, which is very, very important uh, for patients to have uh, for a socially acceptable uh, circumstances in the post-op. Uh, doing petroclival with the retrosig uh, approach. Uh, now, this supramiatal approach, Dr. Ken uh, showed it beautifully, and it is a wonderful uh, approach propounded by Sami initially. And, uh, and the advantage of this approach is to approach the tumor through the Meckel's cave, because the moment you drill the, the supramiatal uh, bony ridge, uh, it opens up the uh, angle of view so that you can remove this tumor here uh, through the Meckel's cave and uh, uh, absolutely you can excise 
the lesion almost completely. This was the size of the craniotomy again, and this is the post-op immediate CT. You can see the tumor completely removed, especially from the Michels cave. And this is the view of the endoscope. When you take it inside, you can see the all these structures, the fourth nerve, the third nerve over here, SCA, PCA, and the brain stem. Uh, uh, you can you can have a beautiful uh, panoramic view with the endoscope uh, later on. Another petroclival meningioma sitting predominantly in the in the in the posterior fossa. Uh, you see this is the uh, skin incision, and you see this is the post-operative uh, uh, preserved eye movements, uh, preserved uh, facial. Uh, mild facial palsy, yes, I may be, uh, yes, because uh, this is the immediate post op, uh, um, but I am quite sure that this facial palsy will improve uh, after a few uh, months of uh, follow up. So, uh, transdentorial approach, it's a beautiful approach uh, and should always be done in those tumors which approach the Michael's cave. And, uh, Doing this approach is you one portion of the one, and this was the tumor tissue. Now you see how badly this was, uh, how badly this tumor tissue was encasing with the superior cerebral artery. Now this in this case was divided into the two, and we have to preserve. This is the third now cutting the tent over here and taking a hitch over the tent. Uh, does uh, give you some extra space and to work through the uh, tent to the Michael's cave, lifting the tumor tissue once it has been decompressed from the brain stem and uh, again uh, uh, dissecting the tumor tissue from the from the third nerve, from the uh, uh, fifth nerve and always do a sharp dissection, saving important perforators, even a one millimeter perforator can do disaster to the patient. Now, uh, taking the endoscope inside, you see the beautiful view of the sixth now, the fifth now, this is entering into the Michael's cave. There is some amount of uh, tumor attachment over there, uh, which is uh, sh shaven down to almost negligible. And uh, you see that uh, entire field is clear. Uh, microvascular uh, decompression in cases of trigeminal neuralgia. Yes, again a keyhole craniotomy. You see a vessel loop sitting here uh, over the tri over the trigeminal nerve, and then a Teflon piece um, between the vessel loop and the uh, and the RTE zone uh, of the trigeminal nerve is placed. Now, uh, having completed this, let's come over to the supraorbital keyhole. As I already mentioned, this is a, a beautiful workhorse approach for a minimalistic neurosurgeon. And um, uh, what you can do is uh, you can make a supraorbital craniotomy and then uh, 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 do these tumors uh, sitting in the midline uh, along the line of attack of the uh, tumor and uh, absolutely no dearth of space once you drain the CSF after opening the dura and um, taking out the tumor completely uh, into the <clears throat> lifting it, decompressing it, devascularizing it, decompressing it, and then dissecting the three Ds of meningioma surgery, absolutely preserving the arachnoid membranes and in order to avoid any injury to the uh, neurovascular structures. Another plane of meningioma, which is done through the C so keyhole approach, supraorbital approach, and this is the post-operative MRI uh, one year after the surgery, showing complete tumor resection of the uh, tube. And another uh, young lady operated for uh, supracellular epitomoid. Um, you see the cost message of the incision is just immediate post-op, uh, maybe two or three days down the post-op, and this is scar is barely visible, which is very, very important for the patients. Mini tyrannal craniotomy, this young kid came to me with uh, this craniopharyngioma, and this is the mini tyrannal craniotomy, and uh, see the size of the craniotomy, and a happy kid uh, after the surgery. Now, this patient with the craniopharyngioma came to us from somewhere outside with a huge incision. You can see here, we chose to do it with this keyhole approach, this yellow line incision, and uh, no need to give a large, wide craniotomy. And you see that these all tumor chunks are being removed uh, 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 suitably. And at the end of the surgery, we, we, and between during the surgery, we go in inside, taking the endoscope and removing chunks of the tumor tissue or calcified tissue. And this is the post-operative CT scan showing almost complete removal of this multi-compartmental giant craniopharyngioma. Another medial sphenoid wing meningioma, where you see that this is the tumor there, which is encasing the 
carotid artery complete tumor removal in the post operative scan this is the patient and you see barely the scar is visible after the surgery and uh, you can do all the things uh, whatever you wish uh, during the surgery if your keyhole is appropriately placed this is the same uh, patient with the meningioma you see the optic nerve over there uh, the carotid artery the tumor hugging over the carotid artery and then this is the sharp dissection which is being done to remove the tumor away from the uh, carotid artery and uh, whatever uh, uh, safely preserving all the uh, important uh, neurovascular structures there and sharp dissection sharp dissection uh, which is always intraarachnoidal dissection this is meningioma the philosophy of meningioma surgery is is the intraarachnoidal dissection and saving all the important perforators especially in this uh, region they are very very important and uh, removing the tumor tissue down to as much safely you can remove it saving all these important structures and um, this is you see this is the pcom over there this is the membrane of liliquist and uh, uh, there are the aca over here and then a small amount of tumor tissue clinging over to the carotid artery over here which i wanted to remove and uh, always a sharp dissection and uh, 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 as much as possible uh, uh, which should be outside the arachnoid Uh, which you are dealing with and then removing this last bit of uh, tumor tissue uh, of the uh, carotid artery convexity keyhole again there are ample situations where you can use a convexity keyhole this is one such situation colloid cyst and this is the patient immediately after the surgery uh, relief of his headache and diplopia and uh, uh, gliomas yes of course convexity keyhole again making a opening in, in this skull through the long axis of the uh, tumor tissue and see the size of the craniotomy and this is the uh, post operative mri which is done immediately in the first 24 hours after the surgery which is uh, showing almost uh, uh, gross total removal of the tumor and during the surgery you take him inside your endoscope and then uh, which assists you in removing the remaining uh, amounts tits and bits of tumor tissue here and there which is very very helpful other such thalamic glioma which was approached through the convexity keyhole and this is the uh, complete tumor removal and this is the mri done about 6 months later and this is the patient immediately after the post op in the icu and you can see this is completely uh, patient is uh, completely uh, uh, free from any neurological deficit uh, you can take the endoscope inside and frequently during the surgical procedure for removal of uh, the tumor tissue completely uh, as much as complete as possible of course without destroying the uh, important uh, corticospinal tracts over there for this we use neuro monitoring and suction stimulators which guide us um, in preventing this uh, technique and nowadays of course we use connectomics omniscient technology for uh, removing and the dti as well for uh, guiding us to where to stop in removing these tumors um another lateral ventricular tumor uh, this young ki- young kid came to us with the complaints of headache and you see a large tumor there and we chose to remove it through this convexity keyhole during the surgery of course we of we develop a habit of taking inside the endoscope and then inspecting around and taking small bits of tumor tissue and this is the mri which is done about one year after the surgery this for the central neurocytoma and uh, completely free from any recurrence uh, down the line so uh, another third ventricular tumor this is a case of hypothalamic glioma now this patient is a young patient who had uh, gelastic seizures and uh, uh, diabetes insipidus and we chose to uh, attack this tumor through the convexity keyhole in this direction and uh, going through the transventricular transcoroidal approach and you see this is the post operative mri at 6 months down the line follow up see almost complete tumor removal saving the hypothalamus patient was free of of the uh, diabetes and uh, mm, uh, symptoms of diabetes insipidus and uh, this is the endoscopic view uh, after the resection you see the floor of the third ventricular over here this is normal brain complete uh, almost complete tumor removal uh, at the end of the surgery uh, which you uh, accomplish it with the keyhole so uh falcoterminal meningiomas now these are formidable tumors again 
and uh, uh, needless to say they can still be uh, done with a small keyhole approach uh, through the convexity you see i chose to attack this tumor through the post intramuspheric poppins approach and this is a small uh, force four four centimeter craniotomy uh, four by two centimeter craniotomy in the midline you see the fox over here and this is the um, uh, uh, the occipital lobe and, uh, and working between the occipital and the uh, fox and uh, I would like to see uh, uh, a small clipping of this video. Uh, you see this is the angle of attack and this is the fox and here comes the tumor tissue over here. Now again the philosophy is the same decompression, devascularization, decompression and uh, preserving the arachnoid is the key for the success of surgery. You see the great veins, the vein of Rosenthal and the great vein of Gallen, medial posterior coronal artery being sharply separated, absolute care to be taken in order to preserve these critical neurovascular structures, sharp dissection and decompression, lifting the tumor tissue from the bed. And you see that uh, all these important structures are preserved. This is the end of the surgery and the post-operative MRI and the happy patient after the surgery. Medial tentorial wing meningiomas. Um, uh, yes, any tumor can be reached by these keyhole approaches. The purpose of showing this, uh, all this is that there is absolutely no dearth of space. Once you open the craniotomy, open the dura, you have to have patience. You have to drain the CS of lots and lots. And then suddenly you find you are in a palace. You have ample lots of space to work around. And this is the post-operative CT scan of this patient with complete tumor rejection. Uh, Suboccipital keyhole for a pineal tumor surgery. This is, I did for about some, maybe 10 years back. And uh, this was one such patient. Uh, this is the size of the craniotomy. And why, what I wanted to show you was the, uh, the space, which is not at all restricted anyway in the keyhole approaches. And uh, this is the tumor rejection, which is in process with the CUSA. And this is the anterior end of the tumor. There you see the third ventricular opening over there. And now you take down inside the endoscope and there you find some of the tumor tissue is still persisting over there. And this is the time where you can again go in and uh, decompress more of the tumor tissue safely. So and this is the uh, in, this is what uh, my humble experience is all about in the last years, mainly in the last six years. And I had my share of complications uh, as well, uh, which uh, 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 um, I'm still learning from, from them and uh, will keep on learning always. Now, a few words about uh, two or three minutes of endoscopic and donasal. Uh, not uh, much time for that though, but uh, yes, it is a beautiful armamentarium and beautiful tool in the hands of a minimalistic neurosurgeon, which all young residents and young uh, delegates should learn about uh, doing more and more of the cadaveric uh, exercises, cadaveric dissections. And uh, the bread and butter of uh, endoscopic neurosurgeon is a pituitary adenoma surgery, uh, which all should, I should say that, which all should start with. Uh, now, this was another example of an endonasal approach, which you can uh, finish it up uh, in about 15 minute surgery is a optic nerve sheath meningioma and make the patient uh, free of her uh, or his visual symptoms is, is this surgery. Now you see a small meningioma here, which is sitting and compressing the optic nerve. Now, this is a focal meningioma. The choice of the treatment is endoscopic uh, endonasal resection of this tumor and no, no other surgery other than this can give absolute complete relief of the patient's visual symptoms. And this is a simple surgery, as you will see, entering from the left nasal cavity and uh, doing uh, uh, normal nasal steps, uh, medializing the middle turbinate and then entering into the uh, lateral uh, corridor and uh, entering into the sphenoid sinus. Now, this is what you see over here. This is the orbit here, and this is the optic canal going into the uh, sphenoid sinus. And uh, the area of work is over here, where you drill the optic canal uh, with a diamond burr and uh, incising the optic sheath. Once you drill the optic canal, and this is what the end of surgery is. And uh, the patient is improved uh, in the vision after this. Now, this is a simple surgery where you can give maximum benefit to the patient 
immediately. Uh, CSF Renoria, yes, I mean, uh, again, endoscopic approaches, they are really beautiful for the patients. Uh, and this is, you see, another such simple surgery where you need to go in and open the sphenoid sinus, depending on the site of the leak where you uh, see with an endoscope, drill the sphenoid sinus, and then there you see the, the uh, area of the defect. You can use fluorescent dye or uh, uh, you, can, you can use any other um, dyeing agent to visualize the defect uh, in order to enhance your, uh, your visualization. And this is the defect which you see there and uh, this defect uh, which you can repair it uh, under the endoscopic patient. And it's again, uh, short stay surgery. Uh, it's, it's, you apply the patch and uh, the patient gets relief from this uh, uh, immediately after the surgery. Clival cordoma as well, it's a, another different ball game altogether because, and it's a very easy surgery with the endoscope because these tumors are mostly extra dural tumors. And, uh, and this is the preoperative tumor, which you see here sitting in the clivus and uh, uh, it's been again approached endoscopically through the nose and uh, raising the head at flap and all absolutely essential for uh, repair purposes and doing going by nostril and uh, so that you can have ample space and then taking out the tumor tissue. And the, here comes the tumor tissue, sucking the tumor tissue with the uh, taking out bits and bits of tumor tissue from uh, the uh, cavity and then you see the dura which is uh, uh, still the tumor removal is in progress you see lots and lots of tumor tissue all lying outside the uh, dura and then uh, at the end you see that uh, the, the, the this is the dura which is pulsating around now. This means that this is the end of the surgical resection. The dura tissue, you see there is no leak, but it's still I prefer to pack it and put in a Haddad flap over there to prevent the mm, CSF leak. So uh, this is my experience with the endonasal expanded approaches and um, uh, overall 128 cases with all uh, uh, spectrum of pituitary tumors, pharyngiomas, meningioma, epithelmoid, and the cordal much. So, um, summarizing um, keyhole neurosurgery requires uh, special skills working in narrow corridors, and um, one should have a thorough knowledge of anatomy. And Dr. Ken was absolutely right in giving the message that um, anatomy is an absolute must for, especially, a minimalistic and skull based neurosurgeon. And uh, one should uh, uh, take appropriate arts. Uh, take out appropriate hours to work inside the cadaver labs and uh, models in order to be familiar with the anatomy, which is very, very critical to know in this area. The endoscopic and keyhole neurosurgery, they are armamentarium, they are, uh, they are um, uh, weapons of the minimalistic neurosurgery. They are absolutely safe. And this is a new perspective. It is minimally invasive and it is maximally curative at the same time. And um, uh, although learning curve is required, which can be reduced by doing uh, training programs. Thank you so much for your hearing. Okay. Thank you, Professor Sinha, for your great presentation. And also you showing, I think, some uh, complex uh, pathology that uh, successfully treated by this keyhole approach. Very excellent. And uh, yes, uh, we are waiting for comment or question, uh, Dr. Islam, please, if we have any question or comment. Well, thank you, Professor, uh, yeah. for your brilliant work. Uh, really, yeah. you're enjoying your session. It's amazing. I would like to congratulate you. Thank you. Uh, my, my, uh, my question is, uh, during middle fossa extradural approach, do you put a lumbar drain before the procedure? Uh, yes, uh, uh, it's a very good question. And uh, in the initial years of my practice, I do uh, used to about to put the lumbar drain. But uh, then now, if you ask me, then I do not find any additional advantage of that lumbar drain. Instead, what I used to do is, uh, if suppose there is a there is a hydrocephalus, I'm talking about uh, maybe uh, petroclival meningiomas or large tumors which might require post-operative ventilation in the night. Uh, um, I do prefer to put an omaya chamber in that hydrocephalus uh, because uh, after taking out the tumor, if you require post-operative ventilation, there is no means that you can assess the tumor. And if the patient is having hydrocephalus already, 
there is a tendency that this hydrocephalus may increase in the post-op. So what I choose, if the patient has hydrocephalus, I, uh, I try to put in a Maya um, just immediately before the surgery in the same setting. And then if I have put in a Maya, then I drain that CSF during my surgery, which helps me in relaxing the dura in order to lift it from the base. Otherwise, if there is no hydrocephalus, I do not put in a Maya or do any so, as a matter of fact. So uh, how do you slack the brain by hyperventilation or sorry say that again manitol. so how, how do you slack the brain how do you manipulate the temporal bone uh, temporal lobe by hyperventilation or by using manitol? yes i mean yes i mean uh, i asked my, my anesthetist is very efficient here so he helps us in uh, in, uh, in relaxing the brain maintaining the etco2 and uh, manitol. yes of course uh, in relaxing um, and the brain uh, is very, very essential uh, and uh, raising the head end and taking care not to rotate the neck much to reduce the venous drainage. So these are all the things that you can do in order to avoid uh, the uh, tense um, nature of the brain during your surgery. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Islam. So is there any question or comments from the audience or... From the panel expert okay maybe i have a no, question please. dr sinha yeah oh yeah dr liu please dr. Liu, please yeah please I, I just want to find out from professor uh Shinha. uh now uh, in, in a keyhole surgery uh, do you also apply the gravity uh, to reduce the retraction or there's no yeah, yeah. thing of needed yes i mean these are natural tools which are always available with the neurosurgeon as you can as you must have seen in my fall tutorial meningioma the position of the head was such that the temple, the occipital lobe fell with the gravity. So I get natural access, uh, mm -hmm. gravity assisted access. So always whenever what, whenever feasible, neurosurgeon should utilize these, 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 these um, small, small uh, things that can help them entirely in their surgical procedure. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Sinha. Thank you. Okay. So is there any question? Comment, please. So, uh, uh, I have one question, Professor Sinha. Yes. Do you have uh, experience uh, treated uh, aneurysm case with this keyhole surgery? Aneurysm. Yes, yeah. of course. Yes. I mean, I've been asked this question at various platforms and, uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. and I can very well understand. Um, I would not say that uh, I started doing keyhole for the aneurysm from the very beginning that I started doing my keyhole. So one should not do that. This is not a uh, wise teaching that I would want to give to my, to my, to my juniors and to my residents. Uh, you must have done at least 1000 keyholes before you attempt to do a uh, aneurysm keyhole because it is not that you cannot do it, number one. It is that aneurysm, is, I'm talking about ruptured aneurysm. I'm talking about yeah, ruptured yeah, aneurysm. Sure. Okay. So ruptured aneurysm is a totally different ball game altogether. You need to give space to the brain in the post-op. So you need to make a bigger craniotomy. Number one, this is very important. If you make a keyhole, unruptured aneurysm, it's, it's, it's not a problem at all. But with a subarachnoid bleed, if you're making a small keyhole, you are having inviting two troubles. One is during your surgery, the brain will be lax, at least initially. And if suppose an intraop rupture happens, then you are in a soup. So especially in your early years of your keyhole practice, uh, I would not advocate uh, this practice. And I myself have not done it. But now as more and more keyholes I have done, then I have started doing keyhole aneurysm surgery as well. Number two, in a ruptured aneurysm, the subarachnoid bleed, the brain is very angry and you need to give rest to the brain. You need to give space to the brain after you do your surgery, you do your clipping. Maybe you need to ventilate the patient again after the uh, aneurysm surgery, especially if the patient had a poor grade SH. So keyhole in these, in these ruptured bad aneurysm, bad grade aneurysms is not a very nice idea to me. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So, is there any question? Uh, Dr. Ben, please. Yeah. 
Yes, hello, hello, Professor Shihan. Uh, so thank you and excellent uh surgeries and also your techniques is very mature for the endoscopic surgery. May I ask? Um, in your endoscopic surgery to those skull based meningioma, uh, would you ask your assistant to hold the endoscope or how would you handle the surgical instruments? So, and can you share the tips for, uh, uh, for your technique? So, so how do you use endoscope? I understand the same your time? question. Now, this is a very, very difficult thing to, you know, uh, I've been in, um, for initial years of my practice, I've been in, I always, was in search of some very good assistant with me to who can who can provide me with the services of uh, gentle services of holding this scope to me but i tell you this is a very difficult task and you can't simply do an endoscopic total endoscopic surgery holding with endoscope in one hand and dissecting or sucking with the other hand this is absolutely impossible this is not uh, this is not to be you know there's no doubt about it so you have to find a good assistant and as far as my, me is concerned, um, most of the surgeries uh, tell my assistant to hold the scope, but most of the time it fails. So I'm, I'm not that rich that I can, I can afford a mataka arm, which cost a couple of million dollars. So uh, uh, um, an alternative to that mataka arm is an endoscope holder that we have locally used it in some form of uh, you know, uh, stopgap measure. So I attach this endoscope into that and uh, I use at times a smaller spinal endoscope as well because this is more ergonomic uh, at some places uh, rather than the long uh, endoscope uh, or cranial endoscope. So especially if you are working in the supracellar region, then the long endoscope sometimes uh, it, it it creates trouble in, in you know it comes in the way so i sometimes find that this spine is small uh, eight cent 10 centimeter long scope is 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 good and it is more ergonomic as compared to uh, a longer telescope and what is more important with this small scope is that it is easier to hold for the assistant rather than holding the long and endoscope and showing you and I learned this from uh, Dr. Boto. I recently met him last month when he came to, uh, to uh, India. And uh, what he told was, uh, I am now uh, trying to you know, uh, bring it into my practice. He has a very well-trained assistant and he's quite fortunate and lucky guy who holds the scope. And this is the three surgeons. One surgeon holds a scope and the suction the scope in one hand and the suction in the other hand, while um, Dr. Goto uh, operates with both the hands and another surgeon uh, uh, stands the third one with the suction in the other hand. So uh, this is what I may, um, I'm trying to, you know, to incorporate this into my practice because until, unless you have a good assistant or an arm, mechanized arm, you will not be able to do total endoscopic surgeries uh, through a keyhole. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Ben. So, is there any more question or comments? Okay. Uh, uh, I have one question, Professor Sinha. Yes, Dr. Sinha. I think this is a very important for a young little surgeon. Uh, do you have, uh, in your experience, uh, do you have some, uh, you know, difficulty or uh, maybe uh, you you can say there is some contraindication for for a patient with uh, some pathology that you cannot do it be, with this uh, keyhole approach in that specific area. You know, for keyhole uh, supraorbital or keyhole retrosmoid. Do you have any experience? So it's very important. So, uh, for our, so yeah. yes, a very good question, yes. Doctor Asra. Yes. And this is yes. very important for the youngsters to listen to about. In my presentation, I showed. Yeah. some contraindications to this approach like superficially situated lesions there no doubt about it that keyhole is an absolute useless thing for for these yeah. things for these tumors this approach is for deeply situated pathology and um, uh, of course uh, for the deeply situated lesions but in the initial years of practice aneurysms absolute no especially i'm talking about the ruptured aneurysms now um, the difficulty which uh, the other part of your question was difficulty encountered while doing a keyhole in i don't recall um, any event where 
I had to convert it into a bigger craniotomy, except one when it was a medial sphenoid wingman in Geoma, a huge one. And this was in the initial years of my practice, uh, about some 10, 12 years back. Uh, when I was doing it, I was finding difficulty in manipulating and having a space. So I, I, I redesigned the craniotomy and made it big. So um, now when I retrospectively think about why I did that and my, when I reviewed my videos, so my surgical videos as to why the need of making a bigger craniotomy was, then I speculated that uh, the, 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 the problem which happened was I was too impatient. So impatient in the way that after opening the dura, you have to relax. At one point of time, immediately after opening the dura, it may seem that it is a mammoth task. The brain is bulging. The brain is tense. You are not able to retract. Don't do that. Don't retract the brain. There is absolutely no need to retract the brain through that small opening and damage the brain. So once you damage the PR, once you damage the parenchyma of the brain, it swells further. And especially the veins, you need to absolutely religiously preserve the veins. What you do immediately after the opening the dura is utilize the the um, the uh, arachnoid corridor. Mm -hmm. So these arachnoid corridors are very very important and they are a natural gift to a neuro to a minimalistic neurosurgeon. Always attempt to reach these arachnoid corridors. Okay. Open the arachnoid membranes, drain the CSF out, and have patience. Sit for five minutes. I tell you, and it is the sixth minute you will see that ample space is created and I am not um, any uh, exaggerating it. One has to see it to do it. So once you reach the arachnoid corridors, you drain the CSF gently, patiently sit there for five another minutes. And this is a beautiful fruit that you get for this exercise once you do that. And once you have done that, then there is ample space, you can do anything. So this is what, this is the important fundamental aspect of a keyhole uh, neurosurgery that we have to immediately do it after opening the dura. Okay. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sinha, for your uh, uh, great uh, sharing your uh, experience. It's very important for our young neurosurgeon. And the uh, message, Dr. Liu, I think, yes, this uh, keyhole approach is our, our future in your surgery. Exactly. So, yeah, many advantage. And, you know, um, recently, many uh, tools, uh, instrument develop yeah, with technology uh, that uh, neuros neurosurgeon could be easier, you know, uh, taking this, uh, you know, approach uh, for okay. their daily practice. Yeah. So, thank you again, Professor Sina, for your... <laughs> Uh, 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 sharing your experience and uh, I hope it will get uh, you know some benefit for our young neurosurgeon. I think that's all maybe Professor Sunha you have uh, a last message to our uh, uh, guest here please Professor Sunha do you have some message for our uh, yes guest here? Uh, yeah. yes I'm sorry I did not hear it in the first instance yeah, that yeah. okay it's a it's a very nice pleasure and privilege for me to be here in this Asian Congress of Neurosurgery webinar series and uh, my special thanks to uh, Yoko Kata-san and uh, Binzu for uh, and, and especially uh, Dr. Raja Kuti and uh, Dr. Boon uh, for their wonderful and a tremendous effort in bringing out this educational program and I've been always a big fan of ACNS webinars I've been uh, through the in the in the back background always trying to see the recorded versions and absolutely beautiful um, uh, what a tremendous educational service that you guys are doing wonderful thank you so much for inviting me and giving me this opportunity to to participate and we'll be happy to do so anytime in future as well thank you thank you Professor. so dr liu please time is yours uh, i think there is a question from a participant a dr karimov do you want to ask question before yeah, we yeah. end our session. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah, please, please. I have one more question. Oh, <laughs> please, yeah. Uh, thank you, Professor, for such a brilliant lecture. And I wanted to just uh, to ask one question about uh, cavernoma cases. Uh, do you have some uh, cases about cavernomas and especially have you used your keyhole approach to 
cavernomas uh, with deep location? And what about bleed, unbleed uh, cavernomas in your practice? The question is to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah for you, okay. for you. Okay, so I mean, the the nature of the pathology has got nothing to do with the application of the keyhole approach. It is the location of the pathology which which matters. And in most of the deep seated intracranial pathology, the keyhole approach is is absolutely applicable and it it is hundred percent doable. Now it depends upon where the cavernoma is. So uh, the trajectory of the approach will depend upon the location of the cavernoma. If suppose it is there in the ventral aspect of the midbrain, then we will have to approach it through the subtemporal route. If it is in the posterior or dorsolateral aspect, then again through the retrosic approach. The principles remain the same, whatever the, uh, the, the location is, it has to be meticulously planned. The long axis of the lesion projected onto the skull through the shortest route has to be the entry point of that keyhole. And uh, as far as the technical details about surgical nuances of taking out the cavernoma, they're almost the same as you do it in a, a biggish conventional approach. I hope I answered your question. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you to thank uh, Dr. Dr. Sinha. Question. Please, Dr. Uh, Liu. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, I think uh, we have very nice uh, discussion, a very nice uh, lecture by Professor Sinha. So we re almost reaching the end of the session for today. And uh, on behalf of the Education Committee uh, of the SNS and the President, Professor Yokokato, I would like to thank to both speakers today, uh, Professor Ken Matsushima and Professor Sumit Shinha, as well as our uh, chairs, Professor Abuzo Gango and also Professor Asra. Uh, for the time and support for the SNS webinar, I also would like to express my sincere gratitude to Professor Zubin for broadcasting this webinar on WeChat channel. And also special thank to Dr. Ben for joining us today. Until we meet again online uh, on next Saturday, this is bye-bye from all of us. And thank you very much for joining. <music>